Uh, welcome back students. So, continuing with our module 4 where we have started with the discussion of heterogeneous catalysis. We will go to the second lecture. In the first lecture what we have uh, seen is we have seen uh, the two aspects which are very vital for any catalysis reaction that is the reactor part and the catalyst part. We also discussed the shape and size of the catalyst, how catalyst can be made porous, hollow, what are the different types of catalyst. The, its size and its effect on reactor performance, we have seen all these things. Now, let us move to a special type of catalyst which are now prevalent in the industrial scenario, these are called zeolites. So, starting with this lecture, we will be doing is this lecture 2, the catalysis with zeolites and production of isobutene. So, what are zeolites, we will see. So, what we will do is zeolites, I will introduce initially, then we will go with the shape selectivity. So, these zeolites are if I want to say these are uh, uh, initially they were naturally occurring and now it is synthetically synthesized I mean they are synthesized now nowadays. So, these are having uh, uh, this aluminum and silica I mean silicon cage like structures ok. So, if you have the aluminum and silica tetrahedral bonded with the oxygen atom it is having a cage like structure. So, once it have a cage like structure then you can tune the porosity, the pore size. So, that is where this important lies. So, it then we will take up the example of isobutene production. So, we will use one of the catalyst which is ferritite for isobutene production. So, now why zeolites? Why not normal conventional catalyst? Because in a catalyst you need some acid side and basic site. So, this can be also made synthetically, but then the issue is the zeolites, the term was coined uh, in 1960s, so it is something like molecular sieves. I mean, if you make a particular material which is having a particular pore size, so it will only allow a certain type of molecule to pass through its pore while the remaining it will block. So, that is why the zeolites came about because the reason is I have mentioned here, most of the solid catalyst we have studied or we will be studying a class selective. What do you mean by class selective? It means if I use a hydrogenation catalyst, it will hydrogenate all the double bonds in all kinds of reactant and molecules. So, if I have a double bond unsaturation there, so it will hydrogenate all the bonds. It will not, I do not have, I lose the freedom of hydrogenating a particular double bond. So, that is where zeolite comes into the picture. So, it means it is the traditional catalyst does the hydrogenation irrespective of the size and location of the double bond. So, that is what we call as regio selectivity. So, regio selectivity means which particular bond I want to hydrogenate. Is it the from if start from the IUPAC nomenclature, so first, second, third, fourth like that. So, uh, you have this alpha, then beta, all these positions, those who are familiar with chemistry they might be aware of these positions. So, we can thus not use this traditional catalyst for the hydrogenation of specific site. So, that is why the zeolites came because it was capable in converting certain molecules or a part of the molecule I would say to a specified products. Some initial uh, examples are enzymes are one of the examples molecular sieves as I told you. So, zeolites being a subset, so it is a type of zeolite all this we can say type of zeolite it means based on the special constraint, it will allow the reaction product to be formed in a particular direction. So, if you do not use these zeolites, if you do not use this selectivity zeolites, then conversion will be there, but based on thermodynamics and kinetics. So, you may get the product, but to a lesser quantity. Some new research were done on metal organic frameworks, then you have the covalent organic frameworks, which try to compare it with zeolites with a homogeneous candle or a case structure have the potential to a comparable effect. So, people have started working on MOPS and COP, this covalent organic frameworks, but it has not come up to that level, it can be compared with the zeolite. So, that is why the zeolite comes into the picture. So, they are given some names, the names means it is a company which has developed those synthetic zeolites. So, synthetic zeolites are given names such as ZSM5. So, this ZSM5, the full form is zeolite zoconi mobile. So, as the name suggests, this particular zeolite was synthesized and patented by the mobile company. So, 5 means it is a framework. So, the three letter word 
of such zeolites are coined by an organization called International Zeolite Association IZA. So, it is a type of particular framework MFI, it is just the arrangement of atoms of silica and aluminum and oxygen. 5 is, so 5 types of atoms or something like that, uh, it is that this 5 means it is something like to do with the framework, structure framework. So, that is why these are called as aluminosilicate zeolite belonging to the pentacyl family of zeolites. So, pentacyl means nothing, it is just two tetrahedral group coming in contact with each other. So, you have one tetrahedral shape, another tetrahedral shape. If they come in contact with each other, that becomes the pentacyl family of zeolites. So, overall the zeolite uh, is represented as NaN, aluminum N, Si96. So, this should be in subscript. Then 6 minus n, so this should be 6 minus n. So it is NaN, ALN, Si96 minus n, and oxygen 192 and 16 H2O. So these are generics, uh, this formula, molecular formula, okay. So the this is where n lies between 0 to 27, okay. So, let us zeolite. So, it means that if I want to define zeolites in one sentence, what are these? Zeolites are a group of crystalline microporous materials constructed from regular networks of alumina and silica tetrahedra. So, the network of silica tetrahedra, I will put it as TO4, oxygen atoms bridge the tetrahedral atom. So, this T can be, T can be silica, T can be aluminum, okay. So, that is why these are called oxide networks and these oxide networks are technically known as techno-aluminosilicates. So, these techno-aluminosilicates can have open structure. So, the structures are something like that, that the pore size or the channels are around sub-specific 2 nanometer pores and cages size are possible. So, you can have Si4 plus and Al3 plus in T atom. But in this case, since it is sometimes what they do, they will try to replace a silica, a silicon atom with some other atom. So, what that we will call is, so basically they want to, uh, you know, this Si4 plus and uh, Al4 plus, so we say it is linked with the, linked with oxygen atom. This is the basic definition. Now, the issue is with the, or I can say shared oxygen atom, I should say shared oxygen atom. So, these are ranging is between 0 0.3 to 0 0.45 nanometer. So, 0 0.3 means 3 angstrong to 4.5 angstrong. So, so small 2, they can range from 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 nanometer, okay. So, see this range, this range is huge from 0 0.3 to 0.5 to 0.6 to 0.8. So, these are very important because sometimes what happens, Al3 plus, suppose what people are doing is, they are trying to replace Al3 plus to be substituted. Suppose I want to substitute, put more aluminum atoms. So, uh, sorry, this should be Al3 plus, not 4 plus, aluminum is 3 plus. Suppose I want to substitute, can I substitute Si4 plus with Al3 plus? Yes, you can do. This is where the maximum R&D is going on, research and development. But if I substitute with Al3 plus in place of Si4 plus, so you need another positive ion. So, this positive ion, so in order to conserve the valency, this can come from number of atoms such as H plus, Na plus or NH4 plus. So, people are doing with different precursors and trying to substitute and vary the atoms and see the effect in the pore size. So, it means why they are doing all this is to create additional create additional catalytic sites. So, all this research is, so they are doing it to create additional catalytic sites, okay. So, that is where the R&D is doing. So, you uh, tune the ratio of atoms of silica and aluminum and you get different zeolites. So, let us see some of the structures of the zeolite. 
So these are the structures of zero lines. That's very interesting. I will suggest you go to this article and have a look at all the different structures, which is not possible obviously to put in here. So they have given an ex excellent review regarding the different catalyst, zeolite catalyst and where they are used. Now see, these are some crystal structures. Now as I told you, the International Zeolite Association has given a three letter framework to identify zeolites. So one is EEI, another is CHA, another is GIS. Now these are different crystalline domains. So these are Miller indices 100, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. So if you see this, so you are seeing it let us say from the 100 0, 0 crystal size, so the crystal direction, so it will be something like this. So there is a cage here and if you see, I mean you just rotate it, you just rotate this and then see from this end, so you will see a 0, 1, 0 crystal size or crystal structure. So it means that uh, this particular cage is of the form like this cage. So this cage structure is very important because this cage structure if you are able to form, sometime it is an 8 member ring, sometime it is a 5 member ring. So, okay. so if it is a 8 member ring, these are called 8 MR zeolites, 5 member rings are very difficult to make, these are 5 MR but this is like a 8 member ring zeolite. Same way, another type is CHA. In this CHA, the structures you can see if when this particular zeolite structure is free from 100 or 010 or from 001. So, from 1010, you see, you can see this particular domain, a cage is formed here, and this, when it is seen from this end, from 001 direction, it looks like this. So, if I just extrapolate this in a three dimensional form, it forms a cage like structure. Okay. Then uh, there are also structures which do not have cage inside such as GIS, it does not have any cage inside. So if you see from one crystal domain 100, you see from 010. So ultimately how they are made, it is nothing but uh, the intersection between 8 MR, 8 MR means 8 membered ring. So there is a 8 member ring, so this is a ring 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So these are the formed due to the 8 member ring intersection. So you see these are the 8 member rings, this one, then this one, this one, all these are 8 member rings. So what are these? So these are uh, something like, uh, these are very useful. So what it is, I will just explain. So for example, if I want to take first EEI, EEI. What is this EEI, the three letter nomenclature? So EEI here is a high silica zeolite. Okay, this is a high silica. So the silica content is high in this silicon content is high as compared to aluminum. Okay, so the cages which I am talking about in this case, this cage, you see the blue lined area, it has a very large cage and the cage dimensions are as per the literature is around 5.6 into 19.8 Armstrong. Okay? So this is a EEI nomenclature. Now if I take the case of CHA, the CHA here is characterized by the type of T atoms. So as I told you it is TO4 atoms. So the CHA is having the type of C atoms, so the T atoms, TO4. So these T atoms are usually, uh, they signify the molar ratio of the T atoms, molar ratio T atoms. So this T atoms molar ratio is different from this high silica. So this is also important and it has 3 to 14 members, sometimes it is 3, sometimes it is 4, 3 to 14 members. Okay. So overall both these are 8 MR, so these are 8 MR, 8 multi ring type of zeolites and the one which has GIs is without a cage. So these EEI and CHA, they are very useful. They are useful in the sense that they are helpful in the, uh, you know, it will allow it, you can do a lot of reaction concerning the steam reforming CH4 of methane, steam reforming of methane or 
ethane, then you have the syngas production CO plus H2 or CO2 water gas shift reactions. All these places, this particular 8 MR that is EI and CHA based zeolites are used. Okay, this is very important. So now it means that the uh, then for example this methanol to olefins. If I want to write down here the methanol to olefins, this is a very important step. The methanol to olefins, there is a particular catalyst which is called a SAPO34, which is another type of zeolites. This is a trade name, the commercial trade name what they have defined. Then uh, there is an Im another important area where these zeolites are used is the NOx removal. A NOx removal means what it will do? It will reduce the NOx with help with respect with with the help of ammonia. If it reacts with ammonia, it is a selective catalyst reduction. It will convert NOx to nitrogen gas. So this particular is catalyst is present in our this you know automobile emission in cars, and this catalyst is known as copper Cu SSZ. This particular zeolite Cu SSZ13. So these are the two commercial names where the catalysts are used for further application. So now another one is the zeolites which are DDR, this is called deca dodecacyl 3 r so these are as you the name suggests. So it is, uh, it means that this 8, these are again 8 MR zeolites but this 8 MR zeolites can also contain 5 membered rings. So this is very useful in the case of sorption or gas separation. Let us say th this type of catalyst if you see. Now in this case as I told you I am uh, adding a NH4, NH4 atom. I am replacing the N Al3 plus and adding NH4 also. So that is the starting product that is adamantylamine is used to create these structures, these zeolite structures. So if you see this is a cage like structure. It is bounded by 3 8 MRs, 3 8 MR rings. So, this is called DDR, decalodecyl, and it is used for methane CO2 separation or propylene propane separation. So, for example, one example is this which I have shown here. This is trade name is called ZSM58. This is made using the so called methyl tropinium in classical gels having sodium. It this particular catalyst has a high silica to aluminum ratio, which is around 31 to 111. Okay. So, the, we move ahead. So, if I uh, write down uh, what are the different trade names of different zeolites and compare with the molecular dimensions of the components. Let us say we have this docile 4A, the docile 4A zeolite C, if you have a reaction, if you want to separate it will um, be able to this, it will allow, do not want allow those compounds which of size greater than 0 0.4 nanometer. Okay. So, these they will not allow the ones which are to the right side, but this it will allow. So, it can be used reactions concerning ammonia, water, hydrogen, CO2 like that. Okay. So, nitrogen, so these are may be used for NOx separation. Then, then is ZSM5, so these are the very common uh, catalyst used in oil refineries. So, you can have it for an um, isomerization reaction. So, in this isomerization reaction obviously you allow the ones which are lower than 0.6 nanometers and reject those ones which are higher than 0 0.6 nanometers. Then another one is called X and Y, it is a mixture of X and Y zeolite, it is also called as phogocyte. The phogocyte for example, it will allow most of the compounds but it will not allow the compounds such as trimethylamine. Oh, C4 H9 trimethylamine or uh, this is dimethylamine. Okay. So, this is very important in this case. So, what we have seen is we have these molecular, it can also act as molecular sieves. So, it can based on the molecular size, it can allow the compound to pass through or it may reject or not allow the compound to pass through. That is why you can conduct this catalysis if you modify the zeolites, especially the silicon to aluminum content likewise. So, overall what we can learn, what we have learned is zeolites are crystallized compounds which porosity up to 0 0.5 milliliter per gram, it makes them remarkable catalysts. 
The pores are in the nanometer range which corresponds to molecular dimension and the pore size distribution is well characterized. Most zeolites have pores between as I told you between 0 0.3 to 0 0.9 nanometers in diameter. So, shape selectivity here is enabled by the fact that the pore diameters are in the molecular range. Now, even if we have shape selectivity where the molecular size is similar to what we are discussing, still we need to let us say uh, you have 3 isomers with different molecular size. So, can we have some zeolite which just allow a particular isomer to pass through that does not allow the remaining isomers to pass through? If that is the case, we term them as shape selectivity. So, these are broken in three categories, the reactant based selectivity, transition state with oxygen and final product selectivity. So, what are these? Let us see and first let us discuss. So, reactant selectivity, the molecules with dimension smaller than the holes or I will say the pores, holes and pores these are the similar meaning may enter and react in a mixture of feed molecules. For example, in a hydrocracking of a combination of linear and branched heptane. So, if you have a linear and branched heptane as the input, so the linear molecules will be converted because of the dimension, the branch alkanes may not ever reach the pores. See, if that does not reach the pores, it will never get converted. So, in this case, selectivity means the term is governed due to the linear heptane. So, it will only allow the linear heptanes to pass through. Then the transition state selectivity. So, it means as the name suggests there is some transition states when reactants goes to product. So, it means it will only allow certain transition geometries. So, it means for example, I take the example of disproportionation of metaxylene. So, metaxylene disproportionation gives a mixture of trimethylbenzene and benzene. So, but the trimethylbenzene have 3 isomers, the 1, 2, 4 trimethylbenzene, 1, 3, 5 trimethylbenzene and 1, 2, 3 trimethylbenzene. So, these 3 isomers are produced due to the sterically hindered coupling geometry required for the others because it means that only one of the isomer it is allowing to pass through. Reason? Because of the sterically hindered coupling geometry required for the others within the catalyst. Okay. Then it comes the product selectivity. So, small products may diffuse through the zeolite. For example, toluene may be converted into xylene, but if it is xylene, it may be three types of xylene, it may be orthoxylene, metaxylene, paraxylene. So, we need only paraxylene for example. So, if the paraxylene means the product selectivity, it will only allow the paraxylene to pass through. So, you have three parts, reactant selectivity, transition state selectivity and product selectivity. So, let us see pictorially what does that mean. So, you have the reactant selectivity means it has a long chain, it is a branch chain. So, if you send the feed of these two mixtures, it will only allow the linear chain to pass through and get converted and broken down into smaller fragments, the cracking reactions. Okay? It will not allow to pass this, it will not allow to pass the branched alkenes. The transition state means uh, you have uh, this a uh, feed here. So, this is the transition state. So, transition state may be like this or it may be like this. So, somehow because of the sterical hindrance, this is not allowed to pass through the pores. It will only allow this reaction to pass through and get converted to products and you get the desired products like this 1, 2, 4 trimethyl benzene as compared to 1, 3, 5 trimethyl benzene. So, this is the desired product. This never gets produced. Then you have the product selectivity, you have methanol for example, then the methanol you want to do, uh, you know you want to put ethyl benzene into it, sorry uh, xylene, you want to produce xylene from uh, toluene. This may have products which are in equilibrium with each other, let us say the ortho, meta and para. So, this is the ortho xylene, this para xylene and meta xylene. Somehow this uh, both these are rejected. So, only this comes out here. So, this is the paraxylene because you know the paraxylene is a very Im important component for the in petrochemical industry as a raw material is used. So, it will produce both paraxylene and water. So, this is the way this is the product selectivity out of these three products which one should go ahead the paraxylene. So, now if I want to write down the 8 MR zeolites if I want to compare the 8 multiple rings. So, this 8 multiple rings you have the one which is the this one and this one, these are already used commercially. So, this commercial use is selective catalytic reduction of NOx. As I told you, we have the NOx compound 
present in the exhaust gas of the automobiles. So, ammonia is used as a reductant, the ammonia reduces the NO2 nitrogen gas. So, for this, this is very useful 8 MR zeolite. And out of the 8 MR, I, I have mentioned it is CuSSZ13. Cu. So, this is the trade name of that particular zeolite. Then this methanol to olefins is very important because from methanol you get the olefins and olefins are the raw materials for petrochemicals. So, you see it is going from methanol to again you use 8 MR. Then uh, these two are commercially available, the remaining are not commercially available but has already passed through many pilot plant tests. That is the methylamine synthesis, methylamine, dimethylamine, trimethylamine. So, you have you react ammonia in this case with methanol or methyl methylamine to methanol or you dimethylamine to methanol. So, you get these products or ethanol to olefins or ethylene, ethylene to propylene or you have cracking where you have light naphtha converted to LPG. So, C5 types hydrocarbons you convert with hydrogenation to LPG or partial oxidation is methane can get converted to methanol. So, all this has been tested, these are already there, another only we are remaining is we need to do industrial or commercially application is not there. So, it will be probably be coming up. So, these are the two things uh, which are already available industrially. So, what have we studied? Let us discuss what are the disadvantages and advantages. So, shape selectivity. So, it means even if you do not have shape selectivity, what does it aim? What does it aim at? It means it will convert one type of reactants or selectively produce the desired product. If you do not have any shape selectivity, it does not mean the catalyst will not occur. The catalysis will occur, but you will have a thermodynamically controlled product distribution. If you do not have shape selectivity, just understand the catalysis will occur, but you will not get the desired product. Even if you get the desired product, it will be very less in amount. The kinetics, if the desired reaction is fast as compared with the undesired reaction, a high selectivity is obtained even without. So, not always shape selectivity helps. If you have a reaction, but a particular rate for a desired product is very high, this will occur even it does not have a safe selectivity for the particular catalyst. But there are some disadvantages like if in the fluidized catalytic cracking, if you have heavier feed, heavier feed means long carbon length, chain length. So, tendency is in our Indian oil industry and in worldwide, you have oil which have the heavier 5 cc because light crude oil is very less. Light crude oil is very easy to, uh, you know, easy to process. But the zeolites as you know, these are having strong cracking activity. So, but uh, what they will do, they will not take the long chain, they will only take the short chain. It will keep the long chain out because of the constraint of the pore size. So, here the shape selectivity is an advantage. Shape selectivity limits the entry of bigger molecules into the pore preventing their conversion. Okay. So, one of the important com coming to the second part, the important aspect which we will define is butene, the isobutene production. Why this isobutene production necessary? Because from isobutene you produce methyl tert-butyl ether and ethyl tert-butyl ether. So, what are these? These are actually fuel additives. What is fuel additive? It means it is added to gasoline. Why? It is to increase the anti-knock resistance. What is this anti-knock resistance? It means that you want to compress this. You want to compress the gas and air mixture, the gasoline and air mixture. So, what is that limit where you can compress without it getting detonated? So, if you increase the octane number, octane number so it will not detonate. So, it means it has higher anti-knock limits. So, anti-knock means it is it the knock resistance is increased if you add these fuel additives. Okay. But there is a problem, there is a shortage of isobutene because isobutene is not available. So, one of the way you to produce is to the reactant use methanol, ethanol. So, if you have the isobutene here, you react with methanol or ethanol to get the methyl tert-butyl or ethyl tert-butyl ether. So, these are roots for this fuel additive. So, that is why this production of this isobutene here is very important or necessary. So, the issue is uh, the steam crackers and catalytic produce crackers produce C4 hydrocarbons, C4. So, C4 uh, hydrocarbons they will produce 
and isobutane is converted from this stream by the isomerization of n-butene or the dehydrogenation of butane. So, you have two routes, one is the isomerization of n-butene and the dehydrogenation of n-butene, second route. So, isomerization of butene means you butene, you isomer, do isomerization reaction convert to isobutene. But the issue is no catalyst. So, you cannot do this. So, that is why we say absence of selective catalyst. And moreover, if you do this to this, if you come from butene to isobutene, even if you have a catalyst, there is a chance that you form dimers and oligomers of butene. So, instead of this isobutene, you may produce C5 plus. So, you may produce a long chain more than 5 because of the presence of dimers and oligomers. So, that is the root, that is why they have made out is you isomerize butane to butane, isobutane. Then from isobutane you do a dehydrogenation and form isobutane. So, instead of following a single step mechanism, you do it like this way to form the isobutane molecule. So, another disadvantage which I have not mentioned, even if the, this catalyst uh, process, you develop a catalyst because it is seen, there are some experimental studies which see that the, there is quick cooking of the coal. So, the catalyst particle is deactivated very quickly because of the coke formation. So, that is why they will do it through this route for butane to isobutane, isobutane to isobutane. Now, then the next question, how to do it? Because again you need a catalyst. So, in order to prevent the production of other C5, what are the ways out of it? The ways is, I do not have data for butane conversion with temperature, but I have data with hexane conversion with temperature. So, it will be similar like with hexane, C5, C6 and C4, it will be very similar. So, if you see at lower temperature, you will get more and more of these branched chains. So, I mean this particular plot means if you have, if you add these together up, you add these all points up, it becomes 100 percent. So, it means at lower temperatures, you get higher and higher of branched alkanes, okay. So, you should conduct the entire reaction at lower temperature. So, higher temperature means, though it means you have to suppress the exothermic reaction. But if you suppress the exothermic reaction, uh, there will be a rapid catalyst deactivation in this case. And if you go ahead at a high temperature, what it will do, it will, uh, you know, you will, uh, it will form, but the amount of this, you, this is a straight chain compound, is very, very high. So, it almost 30 percent, close to 30 percent. So, uh, at a high temperature, there is a problem. You cannot do the reactions because of the rapid catalyst deactivation. So, the answer lies here. Shall we do a shape selective skeletal isomerization catalyst? It means, it will only allow a particular branched alkanes to pass through and it will reject the other alkanes. Only the branched alkanes it will pass through. When I am talking about these branched alkanes, it means I am talking about the reactions from butane to isobutene, total reaction. So, that is why this particular catalyst was developed which is called ferritite. So, ferritite are zeolites with medium sized pores. What it does, it makes a dimer with the C4 molecule to yield a C8 intermediate. This C8 intermediate then undergoes skeletal isomerization and selective cracking to produce two isobutene molecules. So, it means here is a classic example of a shape selectivity of the ferrite catalyst, which means the isobutene production is selective in nature. So, C8 isomer is responsible for isobutene synthesis it cannot escape the zeolite pores because of the branching. But there will be other also isomers which will have less branching. So, those which has more branching, they will not pass the catalyst medium, but the less branched C8 isomer can pass. So, it means why this is possible? Because the stability of the tertiary carbonium ions is seen to be the highest when compared to secondary and primary carbonium ions. And why this catalyzed ferritite? Ferritite is more stable than the majority of other catalysts for this reaction. So, this stem image of ferritite and this is the XRD with different crystal peaks. So, if you see the 10 image, these are our needle like structure. You can go through this article, the synthesis and catalytic behavior of ferrerite, zeolite, nano needles, 
in this article the synthesis procedure is also given. So, because uh, let us see how the reaction mechanism is in the next slide. So, now you have uh, this C4. So, these are C4 at uh, hydrocarbon present here. This C4 then has a double bond isomerization. It forms a double bond isomerization. Then they will combine together. Then it is called a they will form these type of structures. Okay. So, these are means branch chains. These are branch chains. So, this branch less branching, these are skeletal isomerization. So, you have this product and this product together. Then you have this positive ion to be rotated from here to this end. So, based on that, this particular compound is in equilibrium with each other, they can easily escape the ferritite catalyst. Okay. Ferritite medium, that is why it is given like this, it can easily escape. And uh, some uh, part may also produce such structures like with epoxy ring. So, this can again give reduce it a molecule such as this and then it can also produce isobutene. So, these are some side reactions, but this particular product can easily again escape. But even though it is unwanted reaction, but this is produced in a very small quantity, it will escape. So, important is this aspect, the skeletal isomerization. If you see the skeletal isomerization from here to here, it will have. So, these two are in equilibrium with each other. So, this will pass through because the branching is less here as compared to this. So, this will again do an isomerization and have these. So, one is this structure, this structure and this structure. They will never escape out of the catalyst medium. So, it means they can only escape if they get converted to a stable products. So, if you see these are all carbonium ions, they are very stable tertiary carbonium ions. They will then convert themselves into two molecules of isobutene. This is the entire uh, reaction mechanism and it is given in this particular book. Please go through this, very important because it will allow the branched less branching C8 isomer. These are all C8 isomers, C8 isomers. the C8 isomers. So, this is again smaller, it has less branch, so it is going out. This is minor unwanted reaction. So, ultimately you get two molecules of butene. You started with C4 getting two molecules of butene. So, this is was about the science, the catalyst part. Now, how to put it in the process? So, this is the process for butene isomerization. So, what you do? You add C4 feed here. So, it exchanges heat so, it is already heated. So, it is takes up heat from the exit of the reactor. It is heated and sent to a fixed bed reactor operating at 620 Kelvin and 1 2 bar. In this case, what it does? All the catalyst is here is ferritite. Catalyst is kept here, ferritite. Ferritite catalyst, fixed bed. Then it is converted to isobutene. So, if they are because it is exothermic in nature, so it will transfer some heat to the inlet feed and then it will go ahead and compressed. So, what happens? Some uh, C5 also gets formed along with C4. So, you just compress and then flash in a distillation column. If you flash it in a distillation column, you will get C5 plus which will go to the gasoline pool. It will go to the gasoline pool and the remaining C4 is your product which is isobutene. Okay. So, the steps I just explained in the next slide. So, this butanes the input is C4 hydrocarbon, it is preheated and supplied to a fixed bed reactor and is converted to isobutene. So, the product which are coming from the outlet of the reactor downward side, it has around 35 percent isobutene, 40 percent butene. 5 percent C1, C3, 20 percent C5. So, this 20 percent is what you have to recover in the distillation column and the remaining C4 plus all comes here isobutene, butene and C1, C3. So, the reaction occurs in the gaseous phase prior to compression. So, it means prior to compression the reactor is effluent. So, if you have seen I have marked two lines here. So, the amount of heat it transferred to the feed through a feed effluent heat exchanger so that it preheats the feed before the inlet entering the, the fixed bed reactor. So, distillation is then used with the products to separate the C5 plus material which is then mixed with the gasoline pool from the isomerase. So, it is then actually nothing is 
lost, so you add the C5 plus, the 20% C5 plus, plus, you add up to the gasoline pool. So, we complete the isobutene production here along with the various definition of zeolites. So, what your job is here to do is go through this article, it will actually define these two catalysts, ferrotite and ZSM, this particular article. Then also I like to use, I suggest you to go through this website. This is the International Zeolite Association where the structures of various zeolites is given. The three letter standards, the three letter standards, the nomenclature of various zeolites along with this pore size, whether they have cage or not, what application they are used for, everything is given in this particular website. I suggest you go through it and also read the above two. This first one is our regular textbook and second one is the article regarding the catalyst. Thank you.